did come first, the cow or the hen. And so what we want to do here is um, very quickly run through what a project life cycle is and we'll be looking at it from a uh, developer's uh, perspective. Uh, so the first phase is uh, the concept of it, this is where the initial idea um, usually aimed at solving a problem and finding that solution. Um, and then we move into the definition phase where we start to understand the parameters of that development and how we're going to solve that solution. Um, and then we really go into the development where everything kicks off um, the project really gets moving um, towards working towards that end goal and creating that um, output that, um, to solve that solution. Uh, and then we move into the handover or closure where we get the acceptance of that end product, whether it's um, opening of a new road, um, people moving into houses or whatnot. Um, and then we have the um, extended project life cycle um, where the benefits realisation phases. Um, so uh, specifically for archaeology, that could um, include looking at um, community outreach or academic uh, re research objectives um, that have been achieved. Um, so moving through the project life cycle through a developer's perspective, the initial concept or definition phase is very much the design. Um, and this can include um, initial concepts. So um, up there we have two images of uh, the rather controversial Tulip building um, and considering um, its impact to the historic environment, um, a lot's been made, particularly with historic England over its views to and from um, Tower Bridge. Um, so here, um, heritage professionals can get involved um, in trying to influence that design um, what will be spoken about later by Kate and Lara is that sense of place making and um, understanding the setting and impact. Um, but also what you can go through the design is um, the more detailed um, understanding. So up there we have um, an image of the A585. Um, heritage professionals can get involved in um, maybe influencing the line of the road, uh, avoid scheduled monuments um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then from design, once the uh, kind of parameters um, of the development have been understood, and um, we go into the pre-planning phase, which is very much about um, gathering that baseline understanding. So we get the um, early interaction uh, with a range of stakeholders, such as Historic England, Historic Scotland, uh, CADU, and the um, Historic Division of Northern Ireland, for example, um, who act as uh, stakeholders and advisors. Um, you have potentially um, the consultants, whether that's in an engineering firm or um, the larger um, organisations, um, writing the assessments, uh, death-based assessments, environmental statement chapters, um, and they're informed by what has gone before. It's kind of where the pen and the trial do meet. Um, you have the HER informing that baseline, but then that's also supplemented um, through uh, walkover surveys, AP analysis, LIDAR analysis, that um, those heritage professionals writing this baseline can um, add their own understanding and expertise. Um, but then this is where we also see some um, kind of intrusive works to supplement that understanding, because the only way to understand uh, the historic environment and what's below the ground is to get below the ground. So here we have the uh, evaluations and uh, geophysics, which all inform um, one another. And once these um, documentation has been understood and the baseline has been gathered as to what the impact to the historic environment might be, um, we really get into the development um, or yeah, the development phase of um, the project life cycle uh, just before development itself. So here in plan determination, um, this is where the um, decision is made as to what the impacts to the historic environment are, um, how best these can be mitigated using a range of, again, um, historic um, or heritage professionals to really influence that decision um, from um, local uh, planning archaeologists, um, again, through the um, consultants, again, who have put forward their um, kind of um, their recommendations of how best to mitigate uh, these impacts.
So whilst the project is still in the development phase, uh, we as archaeologists really start to think about delivering our mitigations in the form of archaeological fieldwork. And this is where we really as a profession start to take much more notice of the project life cycle. We, as we've sort of demonstrated up to this point, archaeology, heritage, heritage professionals have already had a significant influence on the project. But this is potentially our first understanding, our first opportunity to really develop our detailed understanding of the environment within which the development is taking place and the knowledge that we generate at this stage of a project will then inform those earlier stages of future development projects. So our theoretical project moves forward into the end of development and towards handover and closure phase. Uh, we're into construction and operation. So at this point, the archaeologists have probably mostly left site. Perhaps we're continuing with some watch and read during construction, but our main phase of excavation has finished. Um, but the influence of heritage on the project doesn't wane at this point. The primary involvement we might have is through post excavation analysis and reporting. However, as I think some of the talks this morning demonstrated, this is where community engagement might start to really ramp up with talks and presentations of finds and engagement with museums and displays and that kind of thing. Um, so the number of heritage professionals involved in the project life, project life cycle at this stage doesn't dis decrease, but there is a switch in focus. Um, and then, so those who are involved in the planning stages might move on to another project and the post excavation specialisms, the community engagement archaeologists and archaeology project managers continue that strong involvement in project life cycle. Following the construction and operation phase and the opening of the project, we move now into the extended value stage of the project and again the work of heritage professionals does not finish. Uh, the benefits and value of the work already conducted through the project's life cycle are realised and these benefits can include things like the presentation of heritage within the final development through things like street names, the creation of a community associated with the heritage that was identified. Uh, this, a sense of place making, retention of key heritage features such as uh, building facades, such as as was done with the uh, Reich Tower in Germany. Um, other benefits realised through the project life cycle include the final publication of the post excavation analysis for reporting, which will then inform academic research and assessment work for other projects. Uh, and further benefits for public and consumption may also include things like heritage walks with accompanying information boards and further dis dissemination of information that way. Uh, this work really is aimed at highlighting to the client the benefits of having heritage professionals on board their project at the earliest possible phase, so we're fully set up for this stage of the project. Um, so that leads on to the age-old philosoph age philosophical question of what did come first, the trial or the pen, in regards to how heritage professionals um, are involved and what influences um, the um, understanding of the historic environment within a development um, project life cycle. Um, there's no uh, right or wrong answer to this. Um, the pen is heavily influenced by the trial it cannot write without what has been before um, using the historic environment record as the basis. Um, however, in a development-led uh, um, project life cycle for archaeology, the trial might not dig without the pen having first established uh, that need um, for mitigation works and, um, to uh, reduce the impact by development. So it very much depends your answer on where within the heritage profession you may sit and where you see your involvement within a development-led project life cycle. Um, but here's me kind of um, staking my stance. Uh, we write to make sense of it all. Without, we, we, um, whilst we may be able to dig 
the true benefit comes out of the interpretation and we've moved very much towards making sure that the interpretation is what moves forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Kate and Laura up to discuss uh, development uh, case studies within Project Lifecycle.